Good evening to everyone. Welcome to the Parliamo di Vino workshop of the Singapore Academy of Cuisine uh, delegation. Uh, I would like to give uh, a special welcome to the, His Excellency, the Italian Ambassador in Singapore, uh, Mario Andrea Vattani, and uh, to Dr. Quan uh, Lui, which uh, is uh, a serial entrepreneur and uh, the owner also of the Global Chef Academy here in Singapore, where we are holding uh, this event. Thank you for everyone to be with us. Today's workshop, Parliamo di Vino, let's talk about wine, will offer an overview of the Italian wine industry between history, tradition, innovation, stories, and the new frontier of financial investments. This tone is informal and colloquial, friendly like wine. The Italian wine sector is the number one sector of the Italian agribusiness industry, according to the agri for index which measures the level of the sovereignty of the agri-food system and its component. Wine, wine represents 4% of the Italian agri-food business and 30% of the Italian exports of food and beverages. So let's talk about wine. Parliamo di vino. Before getting down to business, I would like to invite to the floor Ambassador Andrea, Mario Andrea Vattani. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, let me uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, workshop. Uh, we have been, I have to say that in the last year and a half, we've been doing a lot of, uh, uh, I, I, we call it promotion, but in fact, we, we've talked about wine a lot. We've had many occasions to do so. And I would like to thank uh, Mrs. Kwan and I'm very happy to, to be here once again. We developed a true partnership, I would say. Uh, I remember the first, uh, the first uh, week of Italian cuisine that I ever <laughs> uh, participated in organizing here in Singapore was, uh, had a very important moment here in, uh, in um, uh, Sunrise, at Sunrise, and then again the, uh, last year. Uh, we were together. So thank you very much. It's a wonderful place. Uh, I remember we, you were hosting a, a cocktail, a cocktail uh, class here in this same room that was a lot of fun. So um, we like to talk about wine. We like to uh, use wine as an instrument for promoting Italy. Uh, it's a pleasant way of promoting Italy. It's a fun way of promoting Italy. We like to do it in Singapore in particular because Singapore is definitely a hub for a wider region, but it's also a food hub, a food and wine hub. Singapore is, is a place for connoisseurs of uh, wine and food and so on. So we have to be here and we like to promote wine because promoting wine means to promote our territory. It means talking about tourism. It means getting people more excited about traveling to Italy and finding out more. We don't go around saying Italian wine is the best in the world and that our wine is better than uh, uh, the wine from other of our European partners. I mean, we don't need to do that. The strong point about Italian wine is the variety that it has, the quality that it has to tell about itself. And uh, this is enough for us because what we will find more and more is there's a great interest here in Singapore to know more about the variety of Italian wines. The tendency in the beginning is always to go for the big brands. But thanks to many friends, and I would count uh, Mrs. Kwan as one of them, but also many sommelier, local sommelier, who are really investing time to, to discover and make others discover more about our native uh, our native grapes, for example. I'm very happy to see again uh, with uh, Omina Romana, uh, Mrs. Uh, Katarina Berner, we, we met, uh, I think, last year. Uh, it's a great story. I'm happy to, to, to hear it again and to hear how things are going. 
as a Roman, I'm very attached to many of the grapes that you, that you, that you use in your wonderful wines. The other thing is that I, I, I would find that all the themes that you chose, and I have to really congratulate the, once again the Academia della Cucina that is really a partner for us in, uh, in, uh, and helps us always when, in all our promotions on, about food and wine and also tradition, history, territory and so on. But um, these are all themes that uh, I really look forward to, to learning more about, including uh, uh, the issue of uh, wine as an investment. This is something that you, that you hear more and more about, and I'm happy to see that Alberto Martinelli, my friend, is, uh, is connected and will talk to us about this. The point is that it's good to widen the scope as much as possible. I'm happy to see uh, Professor Maria De Iorio also widen the scope about Italian cuisine, about Italian wine, about the the diet, we did a very interesting uh, event at NUS on child obesity and the diet. So it's not only about promoting as usual our products, but it's to address matters that are very day to day and we will do it more and more. So thank you all, thank you very much. And uh, I really look forward to to listening and participating in this workshop. Thank you very much, George. Thank you, Mario, for the kind words. And now we have uh, Dr. Juan Louis. Juan, please. Thank you very much, Mario. Thank you, Ambassador. This is how the wine cellars get opened. I know I'm in, in between uh, you and the great wines of Italy, so I'll try and make it short. I know most of you haven't been here before, so allow me to just explain a little bit about who at Sunrise is. We are a 22 years old culinary training academy. We are tasked by the, we're privately owned, however, we are recognized by the Singapore government and all Singaporeans and PR who come to our school receive 70 to 90% government subsidy. Now, just to give you what that means, for to operate a school like this, we bring in international chefs and faculty and events. Um, so, you know, we're allowed to do it the way we want it, but that means it has to be done in a certain ways. So for a young chefs who are with us for 18 months, which includes apprenticeship and internship, the subsidy from the government is about $40,000. And they don't have to pay back. They just have to serve after they graduate a year in the industry. And this is really amazing. Um, we recently received the new funding, and because of the too much money spent on COVID and buying vaccines, so the fund is reduced. However, it is still um, at least $22,000. So with that, we are very, very, ha you know, blessed that we can, we can train good uh, students. So um, today we had, uh, this afternoon, we had a vet vegan theme. <laughs> uh, so we were celebrating uh, one of our students win in the competition where he recently came back. Competition was in India, very complex uh, competition, but uh, among 53 countries, and he came back with the best vegetarian dish. So today we were uh, serving that today, uh, at our Sunday Lux, which happens every second Sunday and every fourth Sunday. So now I want to truly appreciate Ambassador Mario Batani, because since, you know, we see a lot of ambassadors uh, because we are a cuisine school, right? Um, and we do events, but I think, may I call you Mario? <laughs> Mario is really special and uh, Yumiko also, you know, they've become really good friends. So when we were approached uh, sometime in September 2021 during COVID time, say the embassy of Italy wants to do some event. So you just thought, okay, sure, welcome, you know. Well, my dear, <laughs> that night, ambassador did, we did 250 guests for that day, and we had nine events. 
I've never been stretched like that, but it was so amazing. After that, our staff never ever say we can't do it anymore because the Italians have stretched us. And I explained to you that day we had children's gelato class, pizza class, and then in the afternoon we had wine workshop, uh, Campari workshop, uh, olive oil workshop, and I think there was another workshop. Then we had four dinner events everywhere. Chef Ambassador brought four Italian chefs in town and they occupy four different restaurants and Ambassador himself took a private dinner in the corner. So that was unbelievable. I want to thank, you know, the Italian community and especially uh, Ambassador <laughs> Mario Batani for this. And now please, can we give him a big hand of applause? <laughs> now, just, just on one point, so because of that event, you know, we, besides training young chefs, we also do private chefs. And we've been doing it for 20 years. And the private chefs is eight days. There's one day of healthy cooking. We've never put a cuisine to that. The rest of the seven days we have cuisines. So when we prom uh, had our first promotion during the press conference, we decided to make the seventh day, instead of healthy cooking, it became the Italian healthy cooking. So now that's really established in our uh, pedagogy. So again, I want to thank everybody for this opportunity. Yeah. Thank you, Kwan. Thank you so much. Now, we can go down to business, and we start with the first speaker, Gianfranco Casati. Gianfranco will talk about From Quantity to Quality, a map of Italian wines, and pairing notes, food and wine. Gianfranco, please. Thank you, Giorgio. I hope you can hear me. I hope that uh, at some point in time the slides will work. Uh, I can go for a, a minute or two without slides, but uh, I, I will need them at some point in time. Uh, you guys let me know when, uh, uh, when you're ready. Uh, so uh, just to, just to uh, say something up front, uh, I'm not a professional on wine. Uh, what I do from uh, uh, Monday to the next Monday is uh, uh, working in uh, uh, technology uh, and, in, uh, and in consulting. But I was born in Italy, surrounded, surrounded by vineyards. And that's why I developed a passion for, uh, for wine. So as a member of uh, the, uh, uh, the academy, I, I shared my passion with, uh, with Giorgio. And Giorgio was uh, kind enough to entertain <laughs> a dialogue around the hypothesis of uh, having one of these sessions to talk, uh, to talk about wine. And this is uh, when uh, all this uh, uh, started. The reason why I think it's, uh, imp it's, uh, it's a good opportunity for us to, eat, to, to come together uh, and use uh, the hospitality of uh, the academia to talk about wine, and the Italian wine in particular, is for many reasons. The, the first one I have to say is that uh, uh, Italian wine is uh, a number of uh, unbelievable stories of hard work, of passion, uh, of uh, pain sometimes, but it's also a, a story of courage, is a story of uh, vision, uh, and is a story of successes, increasingly uh, successes. And so, uh, what I what I will offer today in my in my time uh, is uh, um, is to, to to give you an overview of what I think uh, is uh, uh, good to know about uh, the wine. It's going to be a very quick overview. So bear with me, uh, if uh, there are topics, if there are stories that you would like to learn more about, it's only possible that we uh, can, uh, can go deeper at, uh, in a different uh, uh, event, uh, uh, because I think there is a lot that can be, uh, can be discussed and learned about uh, 
stories of uh, Italian wines. Uh, okay, great. Uh, uh, can I use this one? Good, thank you. So let me start by saying Italy has uh, most uh, indigenous, indigenous grapes varieties than any other country in the world. But it's not a small difference. It's a big difference. It's uh, something around 600 uh, uh, indigenous varieties. You think about France as an example. France has 60. And so how is that possible? And then you reflect about the reality of Italy. And I wanted to create the analogy with food because you think about uh, uh, wine as something special uh, that tells uh, special stories about Italy. But food uh, is the same. It, the diversity of uh, food in the different regions, in the different parts of Italy is second to none. And so when you look at uh, uh, the, what is, uh, uh, that is represented in this, uh, in this map, uh, you can have a sense of what uh, uh, the, the, the different cultures, uh, the different uh, uh, enogastronomic uh, uh, experiences, uh, experiences and stories are uh, when it comes to Italy. Then you start uh, connecting this reality with uh, uh, the different wines. And it's not true that you have an, an immediate correlation in between the type of wine and the type of food, to be honest. But you can, get, you can have some of those correlations. So the, the, traditionally, the red that have been uh, the most uh, successful, the best, the, the best known reds of, uh, of Italy, come from regions like uh, Piedmont and Tuscany, where a lot of dishes are based on uh, meat. Uh, and then you see that uh, many of the, the white wines come from the, uh, the, different, uh, the different coastal areas of Italy. It's not completely true because now uh, you, 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 we go into the details, but there is an element of uh, correlation in between the type of food that has been developed in the different regions and, uh, and, the, type, uh, and the type of wine. So, we are here to celebrate the diversity of Italy from an enogastronomic standpoint uh, because this is uh, a unique country uh, in, that, uh, in many ways, but in particular in that, in that way. Uh, uh, given that we, we talked about uh, 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 the combination, the connection between food and, uh, and wine, I just want to give you a very quick summary on how uh, normally we should look at uh, the opportunity to pair uh, wine with, uh, uh, with food. Somebody says food with wine. Uh, but uh, fundamentally, you have a few rules to follow. Uh, if, uh, if, uh, if you want, we can discuss more uh, later. But uh, anything that is uh, salty has to have, the more salty you have, the more acidic uh, uh, you want uh, the, uh, the wine to be. Uh, the more fatty the, the, the food is, the more you want uh, alcohol, tannins uh, to, to go together. Uh, and then, of course, you go sweet uh, and uh, with sweet uh, food, uh, with, uh, with desserts, uh, it's always the sweet wines that, uh, that uh, goes together. The one that uh, it's interesting to remember is uh, because in Asia we have a lot of uh, spicy food. And then spicy food normally tends to, tends to be more difficult to uh, pair with wine. Uh, and, uh, and the rule is normally that you don't want a strong wine with spicy food because you have the spice already in your mouth and you want uh, something lighter uh, to, to go together with, uh, uh, with the spicy uh, dish. Of course, there is much more. It's, uh, I'm looking at the time and, um, and we can talk about that more later. Uh, we will go back and forth with this uh, little chart uh, in a moment. Uh, I just want to give you a sense of uh, uh, what are we talking about uh, when we talk about Italian wines. Uh, we said 620, uh, 600 plus uh, uh, different uh, uh, indigenous grapes. Uh, and here you see what, uh, what these grapes are about, at least the top 20. These are the top 20 grapes uh, in Italy to, to give you what, uh, the sense. It's, a, it's an old number, but uh, the, the, uh, uh, broadly speaking, uh, is still, uh, 
uh, is still representative of what, uh, what it is today. So the Sangiovese is by far the most planted uh, uh, grape uh, in Italy, it continues to be. Uh, and then you see an, a number of uh, other grapes. I'm not going to take you through all of them because, uh, of course, uh, uh, it, wouldn't make, uh, it wouldn't make sense. It's much better to taste uh, rather than talk about uh, the different uh, wines and the different uh, grapes. But I just want to give you a, a few data points. Uh, one data point is the amazing growth of Glera. Glera is growing, uh, uh, in the past few years, has grown uh, faster than any other uh, grape. The reason is the success of uh, Prosecco. So Glera is the, is the grape behind, uh, behind Prosecco and has gone uh, very, very, uh, very fast. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's the wine that is most known uh, among the Italian wines outside, uh, uh, outside Italy, whether we like it or not. Of course, uh, tonight we're going to talk also about Franciacorta, so it's not going to... Uh, the, if you're talking French Accord about Prosecco, they, they tend to, to describe their wine as different. But uh, uh, the reality is that the success has been uh, uh, unbelievable. You see the Sangiovese is in, on a bit of a uh, decline. These data are affected by uh, that particular vintage, so the quantity was lower. But uh, one of the reasons why Sangiovese is slightly uh, going down is... Uh, because uh, of the international varieties. So the fact that uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franca, and Merlot uh, have taken uh, a significant space uh, in the Italian landscape uh, is, uh, is, uh, is creating some, uh, some alternative and therefore some challenges to, to Sangiovese. The last point I want to make is that uh, uh, you look around at the, at the 20 and you don't see Nebbiolo. And Nebbiolo is one of the most famous grapes uh, in Italy. So why is it not in here? Well, it's not in here because Nebbiolo is extremely difficult uh, to, uh, to grow uh, and, is, and is, uh, is, is a grape with a very thin uh, skin uh, uh, that, can, that requires certain uh, environments, certain temperatures, certain conditions, certain terroirs. And so Piedmont uh, and the northern part of Lombardy are the ideal environment for Nebbiolo, but it's very difficult to grow Nebbiolo anywhere else, and that's why you don't see uh, Nebbiolo here. Uh, it's, it's definitely a wine for value rather than for uh, uh, volumes. Again, uh, going, uh, going further ahead, the journey to uh, quality for the Italian wines. The, the journey to quality of Italian wines has a formal start date, which is 1963 when uh, the, the first pyramid of quality was published. The first version didn't have IGT, uh, only have table wine and, and DOC, and then they created uh, the OCG, and in 1992, I guess, IGT. Uh, this is to create a, a, way, a set of rules that would uh, uh, tell the consumers about uh, uh, the wine, whether the wine comes from a certain region, uh, whether the, the bottle of wine has a certain blend in it, uh, uh, whether the, the, the winemaker has followed, uh, the wine grower and the winemaker have followed certain, certain rules, which are rules associated with a specific territory and specific uh, quality. Now, it's simple, and in reality, it's not. And it's not because uh, since uh, w uh, this started, there is no question that the Italian wine has gone uh, incredibly well done from, a, from a, uh, a quality standpoint. It's grown in quality uh, extremely well. But I have to say that the best uh, contributor, contributors to the quality of the Italian wine that we know today are those, and these are, when I talk about stories, are those who have decided to innovate. And when you innovate, guess what? You need to break the rules. Uh, and this is what uh, makes uh, uh, the stories on wine so fascinating. This gentleman here, is called uh, Mario Incisa della Rocchetta. He was born uh, in Palazzo Chigi in uh, 1899, 
uh, Palazzo Chigi was owned by his family. Uh, and uh, in fact, he, his mother was uh, Eleonora Chigi and, and his dad was uh, um, Enrico Inciso della Rocchetta. He is the man behind uh, the Super Tuscans. So the person who has decided to change the consolidated rules, the established rules of uh, Sangiovese uh, grown in a certain way and uh, transformed into wine in a certain, in, 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 with a certain method uh, since, uh, since centuries. And since he did that, and he went through a number of obstacles, as you can imagine, uh, we know what uh, the Super Tuscans have, uh, uh, have contributed to in terms of the movement and the growth of uh, the reputation of Italian wines around the world. He tells the fact that he was also the owner of a, of a horse called uh, Ribot. Uh, Ribot won 16 uh, uh, top global race out of 16. And then he was sold to the Americans for more than a billion in 1956. So uh, it, it, that has helped funding the experiments that have led to Sassicaia. It, it's, that, it's always good to have some, something else to leverage when, uh, when you make su such, uh, 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 such bet, because it was a bet uh, until, now it's not a bet any longer, Sassicaia is Sassicaia, but at that time it was a bet. Uh, I, I'm conscious about time. Uh, I'm gonna tell you about uh, Barolo. Uh, if you have time and you like it, uh, look at this uh, documentary, it's one hour long, it's called Barolo Boys. It's uh, a way to rethink uh, the way to make Barolo, uh, which has created a tremendous success that started uh, uh, in the late 80s and then the 90s and it goes until today. In reality today the situation is li slightly different. Uh, you have uh, uh, Barolo that has gone to a point of uh, balancing between the tra traditionalist and the modernist, but the modernists have created a breakthrough, uh, breaking the rules, uh, Elio Altare breaking his bodies, being, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, this is redato in English, uh, his father was so mad at him that he took uh, uh, him out of, uh, the, of, of any legacy because uh, he, he did that. And in reality, that has changed uh, uh, the dynamic of Barolo. And uh, Roberto Boerzio, who is one of the Barolo boys, one of the, 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 the ones who have uh, embraced this idea of making Barolo in a slightly different way, which makes the wine more approachable uh, uh, sooner, he says, whatever we say about uh, the revolution around Barolo, more money has come to Lange in the last 10 years than in the previous century. And, and this tells a lot about the way this, uh, this has gone. Uh, later today we have bottles uh, which are Berlucchi with the 61. In, 60, in 1961 uh, Franco Zigliani created the first bottle of uh, uh, Berlucchi in Franciacorta. That is the start of Franciacorta. Franciacorta was a local wine, table wine for, uh, for local consumption until then. And, uh, and Franciacorta is another example of figuring out something different out of the box that has created the success of uh, uh, the wine that we know uh, today as, uh, as Franciacorta. If you Google Super White uh, on, you, on your iPhones, uh, you have two outcomes. One is a painting uh, uh, that you can use to paint uh, your house, uh, or uh, the region of Friuli Venezia Giulia. Uh, and the region of Friuli Venezia Giulia is where this notion of creating the equivalent of Super Tuscans in the white uh, started with uh, Livio Feluga, uh, Silvio Yerman, and others, uh, and we are going to try some of these wines later today, uh, just to say that this is where, uh, uh, where innovation is breaking the rules, but is contributing to the success, to, to the progress and the success of Italian wine. I think I've taken three minutes more than 
Uh, but uh, Giorgio, uh, back, uh, back to you. Well done. Well done. Thank you, Gianfranco. Well, to, to take the mic after Gianfranco is not going to be easy, and especially when I had to come and crunch a few numbers with you to try to size up the Italian wine industry. Singapore is a competitive vantage point of Asia, also for the wine industry. To enter the promising young markets is necessary, according to the operatives, a good mix of quality products, new styles, competitive pricing, and winning marketing. Italian wines have made successful inroads in Asia behind old wines, wine France, and new world wine Australia and Chile. Some light on the old world wine and new world wine. Old world wines are from Europe, Middle East, and Northern Africa. It tests where modern wines making originated and where the key line goes, we just don't follow the rules. We made them. The new world wines are from America, Australia, Asia, and South Africa. Newcomers. And again, the key line is, the only reason to learn the rules is so we can break them later. The difference between old world and new world wine making is deep, starting with wine heritage, culture, variety of wines, focus on mono variety and blends, climate, soil, production regulations, taste and flavor, to end up with bottling and information on labels. About taste, old wine tends to have lighter body, lower alcohol, higher acidity, and less fruity flavors with more minerality. How the old wine <coughs> makers have influenced the rest of the world, how Europe has influenced the, the rest of the world. France is the leading influence in modern wine making. French original varieties have been widely exported, play a major role in the world's production of wines, and they are often referred to as the international varieties, Cabernet Sauvignon, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and not only. Italy's winemaking influence has spread far and wide, particularly in the new world, Mecca of California. Spain. Spain, like Italy, has a massive number of native grape varieties that has led some of Italy to their own individual take on about every style of wine, from red blends to sparklings. Germany is far more than Riesling, but its grape, like French wines, has gained traction all over the world, from South Africa to Finger Lakes in New York. New York wine leaders, California. California wine industry has proven that it can stand shoulder to shoulder with Europe during the famous judgment of Paris tasting in 1976. And since then, it has opened doors to the rest of the new world, all wines, to get credit where due. South America. If there is one thing that fans know about South America for, it is that taking French grapes and making them their own. Brilliant examples are Argentina with Malbec and Chile with Carmenere. Australia. Europeans settled in a terroir, settled in a terroir that cannot be less like Europe if they tried. But clear, rewarding, and successful global long-term strategy with French grapes has been really remarkable. New Zealand. Perhaps the best example of the transformation of a grape based on terroir is that of the battle between the French and the New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. A blind wine tasting shows that there is no longer a gulf between old and new world wines. China, a relative newcomer to the world wine stage, China has adopted the, Ch the French model. In conclusion, new world wines tend to mimic and then innovate. The decision of these wines is far less structure than those of the old world. Which, with this drawback, uh, now I will take a few minutes um, to share with you uh, some data about the Italian wine industry. The Italian wine industry and its supply chain has performed particularly well in recent decades. Italian wine producers have worked hard and successful to catch up with the world leader France. 
Italy is the second world largest producer of wine for revenues. In 2022, 13 billion euros behind France by only one and a half billion. And the first wine producer in the world for volume, almost 50 billion hectoliters. Average price of Italian wine sold is around, on the trade market, is around 260 euros per hectolitre, which is behind France, which has an average price of 460 euros per hectolitre. The Italian wine industry counts 1,747 registered companies in 2021, employing 20,000 or 21,000 people with an average of 11.8 employees per company. Italy's mountainous soil and mild sunny climate promotes exceptional wine grapes. The 20 regions of Italy are home to some 600 registered and different varieties. This is an impressive number if we consider that in the world are registered slightly more than 1,300 wine grapes. What's more, these wines only grow and produce grapes in Italy, unlike French wines, which are grown all over the world. The upside is that the, flowers, the flavors of Italian wines are unique and not standardized. The downside is that the Italian wine industry is fragmented in terms of production, prices, and consumption contest. Sangiovese is the most widely planted grape variety. Montepulciano grape comes second. Catarratto Bianco is mostly planted in Sicily and comes third. Some data on production, sales and trends of the Italian wine industry. Global production of wine stands at 260 million hectoliters. Europe produces 60% of the entire world production. Italy and France together produce 50% of the European production. France is the leader in uh, <coughs> per value. Italy is the leader for volume. Spain comes third, Germany comes fourth. COVID aftermath. After, after COVID, due to cutbacks in pandemic drinking, price of common wines in Italy kept falling significantly, also during 2022. On the other hand, ah. the consortium of the most important denominations continued to perform very well in terms of sales and prestige, confirming the resilience of demand for quality wines. For instance, in red wines, the prices of the 2018 vintage uh, of Brunello, Chianti, Barolo, Amarone, they are moving between 900 euros and 1,200 per hectolitre. In the white, the wine, in the white wine and bubbles, of course, the Pinot Grigio is dominating and the Prosecco Doc is uh, the ah. unicorn, is the real giant of this industry. Prosecco is exporting to the United States almost 134 million bottles of wine a, a year. Italian wine industry has done very well in 2022, closing with a new record exports of uh, Euro 8 billions, reinforcing this trend in that the steady increase in export goes pari passo with the increase in the average price per hectolitre export as quality is improving. The Italian wine industry has consistently outperformed the Italian economy overall. The trend is expected to be confirmed for 23-27 with an average growth of 5.8% per year. Main wine export makers for Italy are USA, Germany, UK, and France. Asia ranks at the end of the scale, with Japan being the major Asian countries importing Italian wines, representing 1.8% of the Italian exports. China is currently importing mostly French wines, Chilean and Italian wines in this order. Singapore, with its 5.6 million population, is a small but sophisticated market for wine. Over the years, Singapore has emerged as one of the brightest spots in the premium wine universe and the competition and, for in, and compete for market share here is very fierce. In 2021, Singapore exported 800, imported, sorry, 853 million of wine. I'm talking about liters. Sorry, I'm talking about the US dollars mainly from France, Australia, UK, Italy, and USA. 
it is estimated, and this I think is quite interesting, that almost half of these imports are re-exported to Japan, Hong Kong, Australia, China, Thailand, and Malaysia. New Zealand, civilian, <coughs> Chilean, South African, Spanish wine stand shoulder to shoulder on the supermarket shelves over here. I would like to ask, actually, an operative on this to give some details. Mario, Mario Zocca, that has been active in Singapore as a distributor for the past 15 years at least, but that goes possibly much more than that. Please, Mario. Thank you, good evening. Um, we've been working in Singapore for 18 years now. We started in 2005. And uh, it's been a very interesting and a very uh, enlightening uh, journey. When we started at the beginning, there were, I would say, around 90% of the wine that was consumed was red. And it was supposed to be possibly powerful, rich, and with a lot of alcohol. White were kind of disregarded. Rosé were not even considered. Uh, now we have, uh, with our company, around 60% of red and 40% within white and sparkling. So we basically managed to get a more balance and consumption. And uh, we see uh, customers that are more and more interested in wine that are not, not simply punchy or intense or rich in alcohol, but uh, wine, they have more elegance, they have more layers and more, um, I said, finesse. Uh, we are importing wines from all over Italy, so we have at least one winery per region. And we see really that the market in Singapore is evolving or has evolved and I totally agree with the fact that it is uh, one of the most sophisticated uh, markets that we have in Asia. What, uh, I don't feel honestly any, uh, as, we, as the ambassador was said before, I don't feel any level of competition with the French or Australian or other producer. I don't think there is a country that is better than other, than other one. I think there is a winery that's better than other one. So you might have a fantastic winery producing great wine everywhere in the world, as well as the opposite. <clears throat> it's very important for us to understand that we have so many varietals, and not only the varietal, but the names are very confusing. When you have to explain a, a possible uh, uh, customer, uh, I don't know, grapes like Cesanese, like uh, Susu Maniello, like uh, Timorasso, like, I don't know, but uh, whatever it comes to your mind, to your mind is a bit more complicated than explaining someone, all right, hey, you're going to drink a Cabernet Sauvignon, or this one is a Sauvignon Blanc. We have to locate the wine, we have to teach them the right pronunciation, and we have to give them an idea why the wine is like that. This is the most important thing. And this is the part that the Italians uh, distributor have to take care more of. It's more, uh, as we were said before, it's not just selling the wine, but selling the country. And selling the value of that wine and why the wine is there and is not in another place. So I think that uh, for, for what we can do better in the future, I like to think is uh, still a lot of education, a lot of events, uh, possibly in places as beautiful as this one, and try to really get the message uh, across the customers that Italian wines are so different from each other, and they really are worth being uh, tried and being understood. That's its purpose what I would like to say. Thank you, Mario. Thank you. Thank you so much. OK, I had to carry on. I mean, uh, I left at China, the sea. China is the sixth largest consumer of wine in the world with uh, one uh, billion liters. Uh, it has one bottle of wine per, per head per year. Uh, it's a fairly small market in as far as consumption. Um, 
The population, uh, you know, is 1.1 1, 1, 1, 1, 165,000. Uh, uh, in China, they imported 42.4 uh, billion in 2021, I'm talking about uh, liters, and for 1.69 billion uh, US dollars. France, again, is the first exporter with 46%, followed by Chile and Italy at 9.5%. Uh, we have with us from uh, uh, Shanghai, uh, Marco Leporati. Marco, hi. Good evening. Good Ciao, evening Marco. to everybody. Good evening. Yes. Ciao. Ciao, Ciao, Marco. I introduce you. Marco is uh, the delegate of the Academia Italiana della Cucina uh, delegation of Shanghai and is also the CEO of Savino del Bene in China. Marco, um, I, I have a question for you, if you can give us uh, an, your contribution. Uh, Please. You, you write for Gambero Rosso and not only for several magazines. Uh, you are an attentive observer of Italian things and not only. Do you have any observation to share with us and about Italian wine in China or in Shanghai? Yes. Uh, regarding the Italian wine, we have to uh, understand the situation uh, now, ma especially what happens in the past three years. As you know, uh, in uh, starting from uh, uh, November 20, uh, the uh, situation of the wine uh, was uh, that uh, due to the uh, discussion, the restriction, the duty with uh, Australia, Australia was at the time uh, the first exporter of wine in China as practically one uh, share of uh, 39%. Uh, suddenly, due to the uh, increase of the duty, uh, Australia stopped uh, to import, uh, to export to China. At that time, like you mentioned, we have uh, Australia, France, Chile, Italian, and uh, Spain. This is the five uh, uh, country exporter. Uh, so, at the time, the possibility of, of Italy uh, could be one challenge because there is no the strong competitor of Australia. But uh, unfortunately, start the COVID. Start the COVID and we have uh, one less consume, consumption during this three years, especially in 2022. Now, be, because 2022, uh, the COVID paralyzed town. Shanghai, exactly one year ago, was closed for over uh, two months. So now we need to rebuild. There is the possibility. Uh, I think that uh, uh, I talk with some company that uh, there, are, there are belong, uh, Savino del Bene, that specialize in the wine, and they told me that Surely the perspective, there are positive, but still uh, a lot of stock. The activity of, because the three channel, there are the uh, retail, uh, retail online and offline, and uh, the restaurant, uh, the hotelery. So uh, due to the fact that the hotelery restart with the restaurant could be interesting for us, but for uh, the uh, retail online and offline is still uh, a little difficult. Also because uh, it's true that uh, before uh, the, for the expatriate they consume wine, now the expatriate practically in this three years disappear. In China in uh, 2019 there was 800,000 expatriate. Now the data from uh, the embassy in the last November was uh, practically 150,000. So we lost uh, <clears throat> 650,000 people. Probably they come back, but uh, at the moment, the, the number of return is very, is very few. So the Chinese, they want to consume, but it's still uh, the problem of, uh, like you mentioned, and also Gianfranco mentioned, between new world a uh, old war. It is, is the main problem. We need uh, to do more culture, more information 
in order to uh, focus the uh, different wine and the different testing to the client, especially the young generation. Because the young generation, there is one part that is uh, quite uh, interesting in the changing to see and to discover some uh, difference. But most of the person, they just drink to show off. And this is the problem in China. So uh, what we have to transfer is what, uh, like the academy that I represent, we, we, want, uh, we would like to do, is uh, to transfer the concept of uh, uh, the uh, Italian wine. I just, uh, if you give me one minute, I just want uh, to uh, give uh, two examples because uh, Gianfranco uh, in the storytelling uh, talk about uh, uh, the pioneer of Italian wine. I would like in the Barolo Boys, there was uh, uh, one person, uh, Angelo Gaia, that is dead, but uh, in 2013, in the book, uh, History, Story of Bravery of Oscar Farinetti, mention his history. The his history start from the grandmother that come from Savoy. And there is one sentence that was the demonstration to transfer the sense of one project that the, uh, the, the, the grandmother continued to say one motto that was to do, to know how to do, to know to do how to do, and to do how to, uh, to know. In the sense that we have to mix the uh, uh, activity, the manual activity with uh, the uh, knowledge. It is uh, this combination create the passion. Uh, the passion is the element of our uh, Italian company. This uh, is the main problem. Another uh, concept, another comment uh, come from uh, uh, Sandro Boscaini, owner of Masi, in one interview a uh, few years ago where uh, in the Italian television where he said uh, the new world, the, the old world in this moment uh, in the technological, enological point of view, more or less there are the same because our enologists, they go to China, to other country to help. The, pro the, the big difference is the terroir. So what we need to transfer in this Asia war is the concept of the terroir. That is not only the soil or the combination of the weather, but is really the history that we have. If we, we are able in the future to transfer this, I think that the Italian wine can have a big success. This is my comment. Thank you so much, Marco. Big applause to you. Thank you. OK, uh, time is not on my side. I think I have to close down uh, to make a knot I mean, to my speech. But I need to make it basically to make a little statement because uh, the Italian wine supply chain, grape growing, wine making, bottling, and distribution has performed well in recent decades, both in terms of profitability and success on the domestic and international market. That even though the Italian wine industry is fragmented in terms of products, prices, and consumption contest, and in particular, despite the fact that it is characterized by an organization that hinders the full exploitation of economy of scales. So the question is, how the Italian wine industry has overcome the weakness represented by low concentration and small average size of the operatives? A research paper published in December 2021 by the Italian Economic Journal articulates the hypothesis that the success of turning this weakness into strengths is linked to both. One, the backing of related supporting industries that boost the organization's market position and create competitive advantage through supply chains, exchange of ideas, and exchange of resources. 
and two, the presence of numerous new networks, some of which are formal and others informal, that gives most Italian local production system specializing in grapes and wine, the characteristics of industrial districts due to the local social capital that is stratified over there. That network, which can help overcome the weakness represented by low concentration and small average size of the operators, includes operators such like cooperative and consortium retailer, upstream and downstream industries and services, tourism, research, and educational bodies. The Italian wine sector is complex, but seems to work well. In order to maintain its competitiveness, the Italian wine industries will have to be successful in, in addressing some important challenges related to supply and the market. But let's take it one at a time. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, next speaker is uh, Alberto Martinelli. Alberto, good to see you. And uh, we Ciao hope to see you very soon in Singapore. Alberto, you have uh, a hot topic to talk about. Finance, money, what to do with wine besides drinking it. Thank you, Giorgio. And uh, thank you very much to His Excellency Mario Vattani for his kind word. I've come straight to his curiosity. Well, uh, investing in wine has been extremely rewarding. As you know, in finance, we uh, measure the performance against benchmark. Yes, the, there is a benchmark for fine wine. It's called the London International Vintage Exchange, um, short and known also as the LiveX. Well, it has been outperforming the standard and poor 500 by 8% over the past 20 years. So if you, I shouldn't say it as a greedy banker, but if you would have invested in wine instead of in the stock market, you would uh, earn 8% more over the past 20 years. Um, I make a little uh, caveat, uh, Giorgio. Um, you can try. You won't find this topic on uh, chat GPT. So it looks like in artificial intelligence didn't discover yet this link. So in vino, Veritas. Wine, as uh, before taste and passion, uh, has been uh, always a commodity. It started as a commodity, then it became an exchange trading barter tool, Baratto, then it became a currency and ultimately became also an investment. Um, how this was possible and how can we understand the history of this process? Well, Let's start with the fact that it was uh, an important commodity, first of all, for, for centuries to drink in a safe manner. And on the other hand, has become for thousand years, more or less, uh, a way to uh, bring add calories to poor diet. So a way to nourish ourselves. Um, can you imagine in region where you didn't have uh, access to fresh water, uh, that you would, you would have to keep water in jars for days or weeks. The water would have been contaminated by germs and it would have tasted horribly. So the rich were drinking pure wine and the poorer, the less privileged one, they were just adding a few drops of wine to the horrible water uh, to alter the taste. Uh, given that you are in Singapore, I'm not going to debate about the fact that the Asians were much smarter and they tackled the issue in a much uh, clinical way. Basically, they boiled water to kill the germs and they add few tea leaves uh, 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 to, to, to create a nice taste. But let's go back to the, to the, to the topic. As pointed out by uh, Gianfranco Gazzati, one of the reasons why we have so many variety is because <clears throat> the Phoenician took uh, 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 grapes and the wine habits to the continental Europe, but it's the Roman Empire who has been spreading over the entire continent these, uh, uh, these habits, and they've been created a huge commodity business. And by the way, to give credit to Berner family and Omina Romana, most of the Italian Roman wine were produced in Lazio and in Campania. Uh, now, to understand how important was wine for the Roman Empire and how they started to create the link to finance, just bear in mind that Plinio il Vecchio in his uh, De Naturalis Historia could already measure at the beginning of the first century roughly 50 prestigious wine among 
over 200 uh, different wines. Bear in mind the famous Testaccio, uh, which is an area of Rome, which is be roughly a small hill, 35 meters high and 850 meters wide, made of all the unloading of shards of amphores of wine and uh, olive oil. So it was a huge, massive business. And in fact, Ludo, Lucio Moderato Columella, mm, around the same period of uh, Plinio il Vecchio, who, by the way, was born in Como, uh, um, nearby Lugano. So Como should be known also for that and not just for George Clooney. But Lucio Moderato Columella was the first one to study in his uh, De Re Rustica, the first agronomy texture of the ancient history, to basically uh, calculate the yield of olive oil or wine production uh, per acres or huge back then. Well, thanks to this yielding, they were able to calculate and evaluate a state. So the Romans fixed the first way how to financially invest in, in wine. Um, I have to skip a lot in order for the sake of time. At the collapse of, of the Roman Empire, um, monks took over the technology of wine. In fact, uh, not only the technology, but also the production of wine. And, and back then, uh, uh, we debate about the monks who were more focusing on wine, Cicciotens, the Dominicani, and the more frugal monks uh, who were basically producing beers. We all know that we have one of the best champagne to a Benedictine monk, Dom Perignon. Um, but to understand exactly how important it was and the link to finance, um, monks were basically consuming roughly 130 liters per wine per year. The per capita consumption still of Italy at the beginning of the 19th century was 135 liters per year. Today, to make a comparison, is roughly 45. So what happened is that at the collapse of the Roman Empire, the monks started to create these, uh, um, these, uh, these wine, not just to, save, uh, to, 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 to drink safely, but also to add calories to the diets. Uh, and it's no wonder that this became a very important business at, at around uh, the year 2000 uh, and at the beginning of the Renaissance as well, some noble and king start to take an interest, a strong interest into the estate and started to confiscate or to give the management and the income produced by the various monastery in order to reward allies or cavalries or to support financially their, their, their initiatives. And, and now we see around the same time, some families starting to diversify their investments from the traditional textile business in Italy or banking uh, business in Italy, like the Antinori and the Frescobaldi, who still exist now, buying and purchasing uh, land to produce wine. Um, so how do we come to the modern days of uh, investing in wine. Wine had always a challenge. Wine was difficult to preserve and, diff and challenging to be stored. Uh, preservative, natural preservatives already existed, but the wine was not very much lasting. And wine was contained in damijans, the famous damijan. Well, it's thanks to an English gentleman that he invented, invented the bottles, the glass bottle that we know, and at the end of the 17th century, but it's especially thanks to a British company in Bristol that at the beginning of the uh, Industrial Revolution standardized the production of bottle. So here we, now we have a different way to store wine. Now we have a different concept to buy and it, it, it was um, wine became more popular in, in, in the way of being kept. Uh, what is this missing? Mr. Pasteur. At the end of the 18th century, Pasteur um, developed further the preservatives uh, industry and enabled finally wine to be kept uh, for longer period and possibly wine collection started around that time. Um, if we come much closer to our times, uh, how to invest in wine? The first investors in wine were basically buying estate. So around the 50s, you had some 
ultra network clients who were buying estate, combining uh, land, combining the wine production profits with the appreciation of the land. Of course, this was possible only for huge clients. How these investments started to become more democratic and more available also for, for uh, um, smaller clients in terms of assets. Well, we needed to wait uh, the year 2000 with the flourishing, the booming of the private equity uh, industry, where basically some funds manager, especially in the US, started to create uh, funds, um, started to create portfolio of estate to uh, uh, producing wine in where to invest. And, uh, and today, in fact, uh, most sophisticated private banks uh, put the wine collection as well as other collection, stamps, uh, arts, uh, motorbikes, in the strategic asset allocation of clients. We base our evaluation on external service providers. And uh, this enables us to discuss with clients about uh, what are the liquid more liquid, less liquid investments, which are the bankable, uh, not bankable assets, which are the fluctuation of the of the uh, portfolios according to prices. Um, now, we have a plethora, thanks to internet, of now advisor who can provide you some help to directly buy bottles of wines, um, to choose and select uh, your own uh, um, uh, uh, labels, and this is quite also a new interesting trend, um, which describe how far that this link has been created. Now, I would like to conclude for the sake of time. Sorry, I had to take a lot of shortcuts; otherwise, I would have stayed here for half an hour. I really amuse myself in in conducting this little research. I would like to conclude myself uh, um, with two more topics. The first one, because they involve Asia. And they involve Singapore, Singapore and, and Shanghai. The first one is the Chateau Lafitte paradox. One of my closest friends working for a large Swiss bank, uh, uh, UBS, uh, in 2012, came up on a sales morning meetings with the Chateau Lafitte paradox, which basically was assessing that on a specific, in that specific year, a specific vintage of Chateau Lafitte was mm -hmm. sold in terms of numbers of bottles in China more than what it was produced. So basically what he was saying in China, we discover a few years later, around 2014, 15, that 50% of the Chateau Lafitte sold in China, they were fake. And the biggest counterfactor is a, a very bizarre character from Indonesia. So that's, that's the paradox. The second uh, uh, um, input I would like to, to give you about the links with wine and finance, the banker represents uh, Julius Baer has been creating a, um, a luxury items and services survey uh, since 2010. We started studying the Asian uh, uh, habits in 2010, and then we extended since 2017 to the entire global. So basically, we measure uh, in 24 cities of the world, from uh, Shanghai, Taipei, Singapore, to Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, and New York, we measure the price and how much the premium uh, um, is paid for ultra network clients for 12 uh, uh, luxury items and eight services. Among the luxury items, you have um, uh, bicycles, high performance bicycles, uh, BMW uh, Series 7 car, uh, a night uh, in an hotel, in a five stars hotel, a dinner <clears throat> in a Michelin star restaurants, a Louis Vuitton bag. As I said, the, the survey started first in Asia and then it was expanded to the entire world. Well, we measure since 2010 how much premium are willing to pay ultra network clients for a Chateau Lafitte. Uh, until last year it was a Chateau Lafitte 2009, now it's a Chateau Lafitte 2015. Well, if you wonder, Ultra-Netro clients, they were ready to pay a premium in 2021. They were ready to pay plus 30% for a high-performing bicycle, possibly as an effect of COVID. But they were not ready to pay for a bottle of Chateau Lafitte 2015, minus 26%. Now, this is not, this is not a, 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 a price um, or a stigma on the Chateau Lafitte itself. I think that when we did the analysis, we discovered that after decades, and this is a very good news for Italian wine and food lovers, 
We discovered that after decades of supremacy in the fine wine industry for French label, the, the, the consumers started to appreciate new brand. They discover new wines from the new world, Napa Valley, but they also started to appreciate and they started to pay a premium for wine from the old world, such as Brunello, such as Sassicaia, such, such as uh, uh, um, the wine that we've been described before by Mr. Kazak. So I would like to thank again everyone for your time. And I would like to conclude with one last aphorism. Uh, let me uh, uh, um, cite um, the best testimony, in, and it's a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, to describe the link between wine and finance, Karl Marx. As you know, Karl Marx, uh, well, in his manifesto, uh, in his communist manifesto, he studied a lot the relationship with, 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 on, on wealth. And he was coming from a family who was owning vineyards in the Moselle in Germany. So Karl Marx, he knew how very close is the relationship between wealth and, and, and wine. And that's why I used to say, don't trust anyone who don't drink wine. Thank you very much. Roberto, thank you. Thank you. Gianfranco, I think you are back. <laughs> we are a bit late, but uh, very interesting. working yeah I think that uh, uh, it's good to see whether there is any uh, any Q&A any opportunity to have a dialogue or we we well, we, 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 yes. we close here okay. should we ask I mean to the audience if there is anyone that has any question nessuna domanda qualche domanda un saluto <laughs> Alberto, that's unfair because uh, what time is it? It's, bre it's breakfast. So, uh, yes, okay. Yes. No, it's Alberto. quarter past twelve. It's quarter past twelve here. So, uh, okay. <laughs> and in Switzerland, uh, you have lunch early, right? So, yeah. yeah. Aristophanes used to say, "Give me a glass of wine in order to refresh myself and to say something smart." Good. <laughs> All right. So. No questions from the audience over here. Any any question? Any contribution? Anyone wants to add anything? Even a suggestion for the future? Well, Gianfranco, I think the mic is back to you. Ah, Roberto, Roberto Fabri, please. Uh, more, more, uh, more than a suggestion is uh, some observation. Um, I was not very familiar with uh, newer wine. Uh, but I become uh, suddenly familiar when I send my daughters to study in Australia. And uh, what I observed more than talking about the quality of, li uh, of wines was how well structured are wineries. Um, the possibility to host visitors, the quality of the restaurants, um, all the um, accessories and things that they sell. And, and made me to reflect, because in a country like ours, um, that is so um, leading in terms of tourism, I think that there is a lot that still can be done uh, to uh, add value to our uh, wineries. So not only to what they produce, but also what they do, who they are, and uh, how they structure themselves. I have seen few. The last one I saw was Masi. I think that is uh, one of probably of the most uh, popular, where you can bring uh, guests and tourists, and uh, in a couple of hours they, and for 30 euro they give them a little bit of cheese, they get them some wine to try, and uh, they have uh, wonderful hosts who speak a good English and uh, promote not only the wine but the countryside as a such. So I think that the point of reflection and uh, contribution is that um, beyond promoting our wines, uh, we can promote the country by promoting the winery. And in this respect, not to be global is an attribute because we have diversity. 
and, and I think it's very important. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Actually, I, I, I fully agree with what you mentioned about wineries in Australia, and I have wonderful experiences, especially in Margaret River. Uh, going there, beautiful wineries, golf, kangaroos, and so forth. So fantastic. Any other contribution? Well, I think if this is it, so we can close it. Yes? Possibly to add uh, to Fabri. Yeah. yeah. Mm, some of the, these estates are owned by investment funds or by brands. Elvue Mash is one of the largest uh, investors in, uh, in, in wine estate. And they have an approach which is uh, pretty much uh, uh, structured and uh, very professional. So they create a business in this sense. Whereas possibly in Italy, you have more the mentality of the family owned business. Although we have large investments uh, uh, in Italy too, eh, from, uh, from investment funds. Um, but it's still more something more uh, personal driven than, than, than so structured. Yes, absolutely. So no one has been encouraged, I mean, to, to come up with a closing contribution. Right. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you for attending. Thank you. So we can close, I think. Arrivederci a tutti. Arrivederci. Bye, bye, buona, arrivederci. Buona Grazie. Arrivederci. Buon appetito. Marco, ti buon aspettiamo. Appetito. A maggio. Ciao, 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 Albertone. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. ciao. ciao.